Howdy. Um, so first off, I apologize if there's a little bit of noise. Um, living in the middle of downtown Seattle, there's a lot of uh, building construction going on. There's a new apartment being placed like just a few feet over to the side of me. So hopefully that won't be too much of a distraction here. Um, let's bring that up and let's go bring up the slides. Right, so you can uh, you see the slides okay? Yep. All right, perfect. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm Vince. Um, I play around a lot with uh, uh, a lot of different uh, ARM technologies, uh, virtualization specifically lately. Um, let me bring up the, my secondary window here. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> um, you can find me on you know Twitter at you know DarkNMX. Um, I've been a very active user in our Discord uh, pretty much since the day it was started. So you'll just see me listed under my name as Vince with the Darkhand in parentheses. So there's, you know, the disambiguous, um, you know, with a recent move to Liberate Chat, um, I'm Darkhand on there. So if you ever see me on there, um, you know, feel free to say hi. Um, I do a lot of the stuff, mostly just um, with the FreeBSD stuff as a hobby right now, but I'm exploring, you know, what the possibilities are to bring it into the day job. Uh, with ARM specifically, obviously, it's um, been more cost-effective than x86, so it's it's very very intriguing. But we gotta get the the software there. Um, I may use the terms ARM64 and ARCH64 interchangeably. Um, uh, part of that is because ARM64 can um, just at a glance look like AMD64 and cause some confusion, and ARCH64 stands for ARM Architecture 64-bit. So um, the, the two terms are basically, you know, one and the same for the, the purpose of this talk. <clears throat> so at a quick high level, uh, virtualization is basically you take your computer and you cut up the resources on it. And uh, it allows you to install more than one operating system on a single physical piece of hardware. Um, I'm gonna, um, right now I'm talking at a high level, but I'm going to get more to the nitty gritty in just a second. I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone's clear, like what we're talking about here is, um, with a uh, virtualization. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I also want to talk a, a quick brief history on virtualization just to show like how long this has been around and how quickly it's now accelerating all of a sudden because it's been kind of stagnant for a while. Now, all of a sudden in the past few years, it's, it's really kind of blown up into this really uh, cool new uh, stuff uh, for it. Um, what we currently know of this virtualization pretty much came onto the market with VMware Workstation for um, 386 systems back in 1999. Um, some of these dates may be a little bit fuzzy based on what you know news sources I can pull from, but they're, they're going to be close enough to, to accurate um, as some of the dates may have been for, you know, uh, you know, beta versions or versus production versions, whatnot. Uh, in 2004, uh, VMware um, introduced their 64-bit uh, line of products. So that was their workstation, their server products. You know, the, they had a whole slew of them. Um, around uh, 2014, FreeBSD introduced the uh, Beehive hypervisor for uh, AMD 64, which is um, you know really cool and interesting. Uh, but dealing with the ARM architecture stuff. Uh, the first real big hypervisor to hit the market was AWS with Graviton uh, around 2018. And so that, that's that been um, like a good cost saving feature for those of us uh, working with, uh, you know, cloud native, um, you know, deployments and, you know, uh, with uh, Amazon. <clears throat> but today I'm primarily only going to be talking about uh, the two most recent uh, releases which is VMware ESXi ARM Fling, which was released in October, and then Parallels Desktop for the uh, the new Apple M1 chips, which was released just shy of two months ago. So very, very recent stuff. And then trying to get FreeBSD to run on both of those. And basically what the, uh, the experience has been with uh, both of those. <clears throat> Continuing a bit with the history though, uh, VM, uh, VMworld uh, 2019, uh, they gave a, uh, some demos of uh, their hypervisor running on a Raspberry Pi, and they didn't really have too much to show for it at the time. They showed this is basically what the, the local console looks like. There's not a whole lot you can do from a local console with uh, VMware. Most of it is designed to be web-based instead. So the, this was just showing like, hey, you know, we can boot up at least to this stage, but um, it was. I don't think they had too much of the actual virtualization working yet, but with a full year of development since then, they have since... Um, released the uh, <clears throat> the uh, ESXi ARM fling, 
And this is their blog post on October 6th, uh, doing the official announcement of the release. And they go on uh, to explain the difference between uh, what ARM processors are versus x86 and AMD64 processors. And they also go on to explain what their term fling actually means, because flings for uh, VMware are not official products. They are more of uh, technical previews where they release um, like early builds to the community to get feedback. And uh, their feedback system has been uh, very, very nice, honestly. <clears throat> They've had, uh, they have forums, they have um, you know, bug trackers and whatnot. And uh, even some of the developers have just been very active on Twitter and other social media platforms. And uh, every single place that I've uh, reached out to them, I have gotten really good solid replies. Um, they've even helped a bit with uh, providing some of the technical notes about what I'm about to get into. They've been providing um, patches and bug fixes, both in their hypervisor as well as for FreeBSD itself to make sure that everything is nice and cohesive. <clears throat> uh, Parallels Desktop is, um, rather than a server-oriented uh, hypervisor, it is a desktop-oriented hypervisor, specifically for the Mac OS. And uh, uh, in mid-April, they released the hypervisor for the, uh, the Mac M1 processors, so the, the new ARM processors from Apple. And so <clears throat> the difference between here and VMware is that for Parallels, it is not a beta or a trial. This is a full release product at this point. <clears throat> so it should have the, the notion of the, the quality and standards that go along with that. Uh, so software is useless without hardware. So for all of these tests that, that I've been running, um, there is a, a series of hardware that I've been playing with. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is was one of the primary targets for ESXi Arm Fling because they wanted to get it into hands of you know hobbyists and consumers as quickly and easily as possible. And this is by far and away the easiest board um, Arm system to get your hands on. Uh, for uh, these tests, um, I have installed ESXi ARM Fling on it, and I've also installed uh, FreeBSD on bare metal. Both of them run, you know, relatively well. There's a few gotchas here and there, which I'll get into. Uh, for ARM Fling specifically, it requires either the 4 gig or the 8 gig model due to the amount of RAM that the hypervisor takes. Hypervisor takes a, a, just a little over 1 gig of RAM, but they didn't want to have that on a 2 gig board because that would just leave you with maybe half a gig left for like a single virtual machine, which really isn't that great of an experience. Uh, other ARM boards do work like the, um, the RK3399, I believe that's the right number, with at least 4 gigs of RAM. <clears throat> And there's a whole slew of other boards that they support too. That's just one that I know off the, the top of my head. And I believe we have it working on the, um, the Pi 400 now as well, which is the basically a Raspberry Pi 4 integrated into a keyboard. Uh, this is my personal, uh, what I call the Pi Rack. So I have a cluster of 12 different Pis here uh, doing all different tasks. Most of them are Raspberry Pi 4s running uh, ESXi Arm Fling. And then I have a few other Pies here that are running uh, either bare metal or um, usually bare metal FreeBSD of uh, different versions to do uh, various levels of regression testing and um, uh, with uh, some of the ports that I, I'm involved with. <clears throat> um, let's see here. Uh, the bigger board that I play with is the Solid Run Honeycomb uh, LX2. Uh, again, this is running either ESXi Arm Fling uh, on it or running FreeBSD uh, bare metal. And this board is really interesting because of the amount of different hardware that it has on it. So we have a 16 core processor sitting right here, which is you know <clears throat> a fairly respectable amount of uh, compute power. Uh, it uses a pair of uh, SODIMM slots. So the same RAM that you get from a laptop and uh, what I'm using personally is RAM that I pulled out of a laptop when I upgraded a laptop last year. Uh, uh, it's an ITX form factor, so it'll work in normal uh, computer cases, ITX or ATX cases usually. Uh, it uses a normal ATX 24-pin power adapter. Uh, it has four SATA ports, so standard storage, storage you can think of. Um, uh, an eight-lane uh, PCI Express slot. There is a four-lane uh, M.2 for NVMe. And in my case, I have that populated with a, um, a 16 gig uh, Intel Optane drive. And for the SATA ports, I have a pair of uh, 
five terabyte uh, hard drives attached to it that are running a ZFS mirror for my uh, bare metal FreeBSD. Uh, there is a one gig NIC and a and four 10 gig NICs. However, there's no drivers available for that yet. We're still waiting for the uh, the vendor to provide uh, technical specs on those. Um, so whether it's FreeBSD or ESXi, and I don't think Linux, neither of those have the drivers, and I don't think Linux has the drivers yet either. It's still this is still pretty much a, considered a development board, not really ready for uh, production networking uh, usage. So a lot of my networking, I'm using the PCI Express slot with uh, my own network cards, which having that slot means that I have that capability. <clears throat> and of course, because I like to uh, bling things out here as my personal uh, you know, uh, uh, honeycomb system, uh, sitting inside of uh, a case with lots of uh, really pretty uh, RGB LEDs to keep it nice and cool, even though it doesn't need that level of cooling. But as you can see here in the PCI Express slot down at the bottom, uh, I have a dual uh, 10 gig NIC. It's an uh, Emulex uh, OCE. I forget the exact number, but it's uh, it's it's uh, the OCE NIC, which is nice to know that uh, drivers that were written for uh, AMD 64 are working effortlessly with uh, with ARM at this point. <clears throat> uh, the other piece of hardware that I'm testing with is a MacBook Air 2020, the the new M1. Uh, because this is running uh, Mac OS, it can only run uh, Parallels desktop right now. Um, <clears throat> picture is the MacBook Pro. I personally have the MacBook Air. I don't have any photos of it because the uh, it's not as exciting as my Pyrac or the uh, the colorful honeycomb that I have. So sorry, no personal photos of it this time. <clears throat> Uh, so now we're going to get into the, the technical details. So there's a lot of virtual hardware to go along with the physical hardware. And the virtual hardware is, is what's most important to FreeBSD because we need to have the, um, the kernel and driver support for all the different virtual hardware. So the first thing up, uh, uh, basically these are going to be in the order of discovery. Can you still hear me there? My headset just died. No, we can hear you. OK, yeah, my, my, my headset died there. All right, it's a wireless headset. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, these are going to be in the order of basically discovery of after installing FreeBSD, what order uh, did we discover these different issues in? So the very first thing, um, surprisingly, both Parallels and ESXi ARM Fling had the exact same issue with um, doing more than one CPU core. And it turned out to be a uh, discrepancy in the interpretation of the ARM hardware docs for uh, the inner process interrupts. Um, so uh, based on the way the docs have been you know, reread and discussed since then, um, it's been determined that um, the patches can be applied to both the hypervisor and to the operating system. So that way it uh, disambiguates um, the state of that particular uh, register on, on the system. So the patch has since been applied to ESXi ARM Fling version 1.3, which is the current version. Uh, the patch is currently in testing with Parallels Desktop 17. Uh, the patch is in FreeBSD current 14. And last night when I checked, it had yet to be backported to 13. And I hope that it will. Uh, D26975 is uh, the review. It's just one line of code. So that's something, if we can get that in 13, that means that we don't have to wait all the way till 14 if somebody's using a hypervisor that doesn't have that patch yet to make sure that we can have more than one virtual processor. Because that's when uh, looking at posts on social media, that's been the number one thing that people have noticed is that either A, they're starting it up in real life and they, it, you get to the boot process and it just stalls waiting for that interrupt and um, users are just giving up at that point. Or I try to reply like, hey, drop down to one virtual CPU for now and then you'll be able to full boot as we're you know, figuring this issue out. Um, so that's been a, a point of contention with uh, users trying out FreeBSD uh, right off the bat. Uh, the next is uh, storage. Uh, so SATA worked perfectly right at launch. That, that was great. Um, there were pre-made images for uh, VMDKs or for raw disk images. And initially, that's what we had to use to get uh, FreeBSD working on ESXi. Um, by the time Parallels came out, all of this has been fixed. Uh, for uh, ESXi, um, at launch, the CD-ROM driver was missing. That meant if you uh, attach the, um, the ISO image to the virtual CD-ROM drive when you booted it up, 
and the um, the BIOS handed the boot process over to the kernel to say, hey, you know, it, use your driver to, to continue reading from the, the CD-ROM disk. The kernel uh, didn't know how to mount the, the disk and would just stall indefinitely at that point. Um, funny enough, the CD-ROM driver was already in review to be added to the generic kernel at that point uh, for a uh, one of the server boards because it had an optional uh, CD-ROM, even though usually people have been installing the OS through USB. And so with ESXi having a very set use case for this, it was able to fast track getting that into the uh, ARM generic kernel. Um, PVSCSI was another one that was missing that has since been uh, added. Um, there's been some bugs back and forth with ESXi on that where PVSCSI could not be booted from and that's uh, since been fixed in uh, 1.3. Uh, NVMe booting ha had a similar issue uh, booting, and that's mostly been fixed, but there's been a secondary bug that they weren't aware of, so it's still not fully working. Uh, basically, their uh, virtual EFI inside of the virtual machine um, only would boot from SATA or uh, USB, or, or not USB, um, SATA or the CD-ROM. So their, their virtual BIOS didn't know how to boot from PVSCSI or from NVMe. So they just had to write basically an uh, uh, updated boot code on their, um, their virtual EFI. So yeah, and the, the hacky things that were needed until the CD-ROM driver is that um, like for the raw image, uh, for the, there was a raw image for the installer. Uh, I converted that from raw to VMDK but then when you put the VMDK on the server, the VMDK is the uh, workstation version. And on server, it needs yet another conversion. And then you mount that as a second hard drive uh, inside of the virtual machine. And then you boot from that hard drive to install to the first hard drive. And it was this long, complicated process just to be able to do a manual install if you wanted to use ZFS rather than the pre-made uh, UFS images. Uh, uh, USB hardware has been kind of interesting. Um, the very next thing, if you start playing around with USB a lot, you'll notice that you could, e uh, at least in the early days, you'd easily break your keyboard and mouse, especially the keyboard, um, because there's no PS2 on, uh, on ARM at all. So on x86, if you didn't have uh, USB drivers in your kernel, um, it would just fall back to PS2 and the kernel would pick it up perfectly. Uh, on ARM, that's, there is no option for that. You have to have USB no matter what. At launch, there was a couple of the HCI drivers. I think it was EHCI, possibly. I can't remember exactly which ones were missing. Um, but they're now all included. Uh, all of the various USB controllers are now included. Because uh, initially with ARM, the drivers were being included one off at a time based on boards that people were testing. And then with the, uh, VMware, it was uh, determined that we should just have all of the various USB controllers going forward at this point. Um, right now. There's still a couple issues with mount, the mouse support. So the UMS, the USB mouse driver, is not automatically loaded. Uh, I just tested that last night, and that um, still needs to be added to your loader.com for the mouse to work properly. Um, so I'm not sure why that's not being detected, because it does detect that there is a device there, but it's not loading the, uh, the, USB, driver, the USB mouse driver specifically. Also right now, because it requires the SVGA driver, which I'll get to in a second, um, we don't have that smooth transition of the mouse in and out of the window when you're in a desktop environment in a VM. So you still have to use the keyboard combination to um, unlock your, um, uh, how it kind of like captures your mouse and keyboard input. You still have to use the keyboard combination to, to uh, unlock from that. Uh, networking, uh, VMware by default uses the E1000 series, uh, you know, Intel drivers. And that was already included in uh, FreeBSD, so that worked great. Uh, there was the VMXNet driver, which for good reason was not included initially with uh, uh, the ARM um, generic kernel. That's because there was no VMware hypervisor until like th this one launched, right? And so just simply adding it, it worked perfectly with no modification whatsoever. That was a really easy fix. Uh, for Parallels Desktop, it uses the VirIO uh, VTNet driver, and that just worked perfectly with no modification at all. So we had great networking there. Um, right on day one. Uh, audio has been kind of a little interesting thing because I never even thought to test it because I've mostly been dealing with uh, server stuff. I haven't really touched too much of the, uh, the, the desktop space of things. Um, but I went back and retested this just to, to validate this. 
Right now, there's no real audio support on ESXi ARM Fling. And the reason for it is because uh, just a VMware in general, when you're dealing with the uh, ESXi versions, their server versions, they don't have audio support over their, uh, their remote, um, the remote protocol that they use. So until we get VMware Fusion on the M1, which would work as a desktop hypervisor rather than a bare metal hypervisor, uh, we really won't know what their audio support is going to be like. Uh, in that regards, um, based on all of the chatter I've seen on social media, uh, we should be getting a tech preview of Fusion uh, pretty much any day now, it looks like. Um, and they're talking about having it fully released by the end of the year. So there'll be more uh, to update on that really soon. Um, just because I was screwing around with it, uh, I was um, tried installing a FreeBSD desktop on a Parallels desktop VM and found that it was missing the uh, high definition audio driver. And so we have the bug ID uh, 256.204 uh, where we're discussing the best way to load that driver automatically. Manually loading the driver audio worked perfectly. I was playing uh, YouTube clips and there was no audio stuttering whatsoever. Um, and since there was no SVGA driver, uh, even the video playback had to use software decoding rather than hardware decoding. And even with that extra pressure on the processor, there was no issues whatsoever uh, with audio playback. It just worked flawlessly first try, it was really nice. Uh, video, uh, the, so the SVGA uh, drivers, uh, we're kind of up in the air right now. Um, talking with the developers over at uh, VMware for theirs, uh, they're working on a new uh, virtual video card uh, right now. Uh, it has a new um, PCI ID, so the other driver won't even detect it. Uh, the hardware spec is different. Uh, my personal uh, speculation is that they're, um, they're working on Vulkan support. Um, because the existing driver had OpenGL support and DirectX support, so you can do uh, 3D gaming and you know the 3D desktop different uh, uh, features with it. It wasn't fully performant, but it was much, much better than doing it in software. So I can only assume at this point that they're making a new one for Vulkan, but I could be wrong. It's just personal speculation. So right now, uh, we're using the, the EFI frame buffer, and that's why the mouse capture uh, doesn't work yet, because it requires the two drivers to communicate with each other. And for um, the parallels, I've not looked into what they use for a video system, but so far just a default install uses the EFI frame buffer as well. Uh, I don't know what they use for um, uh, on their Intel systems. I'm not sure what they used for a video driver there anyway, since I've never used parallels up until this point and haven't had the chance to research that. Uh, for other hardware, there's the VMCI driver. Uh, it's virtual machine communication interface, I think is what that stands for. It's so two VMs have a high performance interface for communicating back and forth. So something faster than going through the virtual network stack. And right now it contains a bunch of x86 assembly and I'm not sure if that's even supported on ESXi arm fling yet. Um, I haven't tested it. I haven't looked into the, the assembly code or doing any rewriting of that. Uh, I don't even know any software that uses the VMCI interface. It's something I've personally not used, so that's going to be something we'll have to uh, look at in the, the future at, at some point. I don't know when. Uh, some quick limitations. These are notes that the, uh, the VMware devs gave me. Uh, vMotion, which is the ability to migrate a virtual machine from one host to another. Uh, if they're the same, exact same system, so a Raspberry Pi to a Raspberry Pi, it should work. Um, I believe I have actually tested that and it did work in my case, but going from, let's say a Pi to a Honeycomb, even though they're both uh, Cortex A72 processors, they're not the same A72 processor. Uh, something with ARM spec is that uh, each manufacturer can turn on and off different optional uh, features in the processor. And so that, that's causing some issues with getting that same level of consistency we have on x86 right now, where let's say an Intel Skylake is an Intel Skylake, and we know that. And so being able to go between two Skylake systems is, um, it's the same generation processor, so it'll work, but we don't have that flexibility in ARM yet. Um, possibly ARM V9 may address some of this, because I believe they're locking down part of the standard on what's optional and what's not. So um, we'll have to wait and see. And also another note that they gave me is that currently none of the CPUs they've tested apparently support nested virtualization. So that's something else that we're not going to be able to play with just yet. Maybe V9 um, or a future ARM spec will have that capability. Uh, getting into the, the software side of things, um, 
there's the ports for parallels tools. Uh, this one is very, very simple, simple to change. It's bug 256 to 279. And <clears throat> uh, it, all it required was telling the, the port uh, what that ARM64 is 64 bit. That's it. A very simple change, and it just worked. Uh, I'm not sure how to test. Yeah, I'm not too sure on how to test that one, um, just because uh, I'm not familiar with what all Parallels tools do. Um, it seems to be maybe just, as it says there, the file is PVM net, so some sort of network driver, possibly. But they're using ver IO, so this may not even be something that they use anymore. This could just be some old dead code at this point. Uh, open VM tools um, was quite a bit more complex because it is a much, much larger tool set, required significant amount of change. So there's um, that's being tracked under 256, 282. Uh, these changes from um, everything that I've done should be live upstream at this point, but they have not pushed a, uh, a new release since all of these changes were made. So if you're using the current version of uh, VMware tools, the current released version, uh, you'll need all of these patches, which is what that, that bug references. So if we want to get this into ports because there's still no word on when they're releasing a new version of VMware tools or the open VM tools, uh, um, we have the option to bring this into ports now, or we either wait we, we either bring it in now using these patch sets, or we wait until the next official release upstream happens, and we use that instead. Um, uh, this one has been validated, tested, working, everything like that. So with uh, OpenVM tools, uh, it passes information from the client to the, uh, the hypervisor. Now, let me shut my window. They're doing really noisy. All right. So it passes information from the uh, client to the hypervisor. So it shows the IP address, the host name, um, which version of the tools you're running, as well as a bunch of information uh, on storage. And so you can see how I have basically two different ZFS pools going on right now, one for the root file system and another one for my MariaDB instance. And uh, a lot of the work I do is surrounding around uh, uh, MariaDB. <clears throat> Uh, so what's really cool with all of this is that there's what's called vSphere, and that allows you to manage multiple uh, uh, VMware uh, ESXi hosts, uh, all from a single dashboard. <clears throat> and with this particular uh, vSphere instance, I'm running uh, or I'm managing systems in multiple home labs right now. So I have you know, my home lab here in Seattle, and then I have different family member houses and friends' houses where I've set up some home labs as well. But also, uh, I'm managing both x86 and ARM from the same vSphere uh, uh, server at this point. So you can see here where I have my ARM cluster, another ARM cluster, and then two x86 clusters there on the left with a, uh, a whole assortment of hosts underneath, underneath each of them with um, the virtual machines underneath that. I can just at a glance see um, what the status of uh, any of these machines are you know, what they're doing. Um, I can go into their consoles, I can add VMs, I can remove VMs, power them up, you know, power them down, whatever I need to do. Uh, you can see that under my ARM cluster, there's two machines currently broken. Uh, that's very intentional currently. One of them is my solid run machine. One of them is the Raspberry Pi 4 gig unit, which uh, I used for the testing, which I'll get to in just a second. <clears throat> Uh, some of the testing that I actually use with all of this, um, you may have noticed the name uh, zero tier in <clears throat> a lot of those virtual machines. So the reason why virtual machines are really important is it allows us to do a lot of regression testing and compatibility testing, um, especially around ports, which is where I spend most of my time. Uh, zero tier is a software defined networking stack that I use very extensively. And as you can see here, I have my uh, like ARM64 on FreeBSD 12.2 12, 12 at the top. Um, there's ARM v6, ARM v7. Um, I have some i386. Um, and all of these machines are all sharing one software defined network, regardless of their architecture, which is really, really nice. Uh, and you can see specifically, I have a test instance up here where it notes that this commit broke. Uh, I was trying to figure out exactly where a particular patch in um, zero tier upstream broke only on FreeBSD ARM. And so I was able to spin up multiple instances 
and have them running at multiple different uh, versions of zero tier simultaneously, which you can see the versions on the right over here to try to gauge where, um, where the regression actually happened. And I can compare them all in real time just by spinning up multiple VMs without having to touch the physical hardware. Uh, I do this a lot for testing 12 versus 13 versus 14 with some of these ports and being able to jump between those versions without having to, like with the Raspberry Pi, I don't need to pull out the SD card. I don't need to pull out the USB drive. I can just have all of those booted and running simultaneously in parallel now. Um, and that's really sped up the ability to debug regression testing. Um, so I also did uh, a bunch of benchmarking. Uh, if you've been following my Twitter, you've probably seen me rant about that all week this uh, this week, especially with everything that went wrong with it, <laughs> which I'll get into in a bit. Um, for the Pi 4, I used a four or I used an eight gig model with ESXi Arm Fling. Um, for bare metal, I used a four gig the four gig model. Uh, for the Honeycomb, again, I'm using uh, ESXi Arm Fling, and then I ran it bare metal as well. And then I had the, the MacBook uh, M1 running parallel 17 beta. All of these running, um, all of these are running FreeBSD 13 release. So um, no patching, no security, just the, the 13 release. That way everything had the exact same version. It was uh, easier to manage. Uh, all of the virtual machines had four gigs of uh, VRAM in them. Uh, with this, uh, that was more than enough RAM to do, the, uh, to do a build kernel. Uh, without ever swapping, it uses at most about two gigs of RAM to do that. So there's still headroom left over for um, like the ARC and other things to, to kick in with ZFS. Um, and then I had the four gig Raspberry Pi um, for the bare metal testing to match the RAM size uh, of the VMs. And then for the Honeycomb, I had 16 gigs of RAM just because that's what it physically has. And I don't have a, any four gig sticks to shove into it to do smaller testing. So I just left it as is. Uh, for ZFS, um, this is usually just what I use for uh, my build environments because how easily they are to reproduce. So I turn off uh, sync. Um, I set a time off. I set record size to one meg and I set compression to LZ4. That way I can focus on just the compute aspect of things. Um, with sync disabled, uh, the Git repository, I can just reclone or update whatever I need to do. So if, if that failed, that's easy to reproduce. And if a build failed, um, because you know the machine lost power or whatever, I can rebuild it. That's not a big deal. Uh, a time, of course, you just always have that off. Uh, record size set to one meg that uh, because most artifacts and the uh, either the source code or the objects that are built, you're going to be reading the entire artifact beginning to end no matter what um, during the compile process. So having a larger record size just makes that easier. And then compression, uh, especially with the embedded systems, because their storage is slower. That um, I did at times notice that storage was the limiting factor, not compute, depending on what uh, task I happen to be doing at the time. And then to pull the source code, I'm using uh, GitHub. Um, just because of where I'm situated, it's a very fast mirror for me. And I do uh, shallow cloning um, with a depth of one and specifically specify the release branch 13. So that way I'm only pulling down the code that I need without worrying about the entire tree of you know the, the full historical tree in Git or all of the other branches like 14 and everything else. I don't need all of that for the, the benchmarking. <clears throat> and now probably the most interesting and the most painful slide uh, for me to make, I'm uh, just running a build kernel. This is pretty much the only benchmark I was doing um, because I just wanted just a high level overview of the performance difference of virtualization versus uh, bare metal. And there's some, minor uh, issues here and there in terms of, again, storage performance, where the Raspberry Pi um, actually crosses over uh, um, based on the number of cores in use and how well it can interact with the storage for how well that performed. Um, and then we see them, the middle line middle lines here, that's the uh, solid run hun uh, honeycomb. And consistently, bare metal is just slightly faster than virtualization. So there's just a minor performance hit there. And that's a bit more what we'd expect from virtualization um, when you have good, solid, stable storage on both the VM and the host, which that did. On the Raspberry Pi, the storage you know, using USB storage isn't the greatest and has the performance impacts. And I think that's part of what's 
uh, affecting those benchmarks. But then we get down to uh, the M1 um, running, a, you know, there is no bare metal, just hypervisor. And this really highlights what Apple has done with their processor um, and their ARM technology is that their single core performance is nearly five times faster than the uh, solid run performance. And even if we get all the way down here to like the, the four core performance, we're still looking at about four times faster than the, the, the honeycomb. So, uh, and that's the honeycomb, you know, physical hardware versus a virtual machine running on a MacBook Air. And to note the, the MacBook specifically is that it can actually run faster than this. Uh, the air has no active cooling and it was actually thermal throttling in these tests. The longer they ran, um, if I ran multiple tests in succession, it would get slower and slower and slower over time. Um, and this is about where uh, it leveled out at. So uh, this just really goes to show what Apple has done with their, uh, their optimization and their performance that uh, even at a single core at you know, full bursting potential, is still in the realm of about uh, eight to 12 cores on the, the honeycomb. And so uh, I've moved a lot of my building um, and ports uh, development over to a virtual machine on there instead, just because of how much quicker I can compile and, and do my testing. It's, it's been just night and day how, how well that's working now. Um, and then the, the last piece of information I have is the Raspberry Pi Oddity. This is what I've been complaining about on social media all week is that I kept getting these really, really long build times and I couldn't figure out why when dealing with physical hardware. And it turned out that um, using the pre-built Raspberry Pi image, uh, it does not have PowerD running by default and the Pi would default to its lowest power state of 600 megahertz rather than the 1500 megahertz. Um, uh, because of that, it just ran really, really slow and I had no idea why. It took me three days to figure that out. And so a, um, I, I think at this point it would be advantageous for the board specific images that we build, such as the Raspberry Pi image, that we now start including PowerD by default because otherwise um, users are just gonna download the image and not know about this issue. They're gonna run it and they're gonna say, oh, this is, you know, significantly slower than my comparable Linux image that I run on it. And that's a chance for pushing people away from FreeBSD, thinking that the operating system um, has some serious issue with it. When in reality, it's just the, the power management and the power states aren't um, actively being managed as they should. And that's just as simple, you know, just adding the service to um, in your RC comp and that's it. So that's um, about it for what I have for today. Um, special thanks to the VMware development team. They have been very responsive. Uh, any question I have, they've been very quick and, and easy to get a hold of. They've, uh, they've provided a lot of information, especially for these slides. Uh, they've been doing um, patches and fixing things um, very quickly. Um, and then we have Ed from the FreeBSD Foundation. He's been great at pushing through all the changes that we need, uh, making sure that uh, everything works. Uh, everything has been, you know, stable. If there's uh, any drivers missing or if there's any code changes that need to be made, uh, he's been doing a great job of making sure those get um, reviewed very quickly. And of course, uh, all of you awesome people have just been, you know, part of the FreeBSD community because a lot of this code uh, that we're using on ARM already existed before this, like especially the, the PV SCSI and, you know, VMX net drivers. Uh, all we had to do was turn those on and they, they worked with no modification at all. And so a lot of this was just pre-done and right now we're just flipping flags and validating that it works. So that's been really, really great. Um, so at this point, are there uh, any questions um, pending for this? I don't think I saw any on IRC. Um, but I think we also probably schedule-wise, it'd be good if we go ahead and take a break. But thank you very much for your talk. Uh, that's really neat stuff. Glad to see virtualization working with ARM64 on FreeBSD. Uh, so let's go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll have Matt Ahrens talking about RAID Z expansion. Thanks again, Vincent. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> 